Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here with us. This is a special, uh, special session of Real Creative Leadership. And we're going to get into the topic in just a second. But first, uh, just a little bit of, uh, of a welcome to those who are joining Real Creative Leadership for the first time. Hello from Adam Morgan. I'm Executive Creative Director at Adobe. And my uh, co-host here today is Chris Doe from the future. We'll get into our personal introductions in a second as well. And just a little bit of background for those who are joining for the first time of what real creative leadership is all about. There, is, there are many websites out there in, in the webverse where you can increase your skills, figure out how to be a better designer, a better writer, better videographer, whatever your creative skill is. But there's really not a huge uh, you know, opportunity to learn more about leadership and leadership, not just in the general sense of leadership, but in creative leadership. So how creativity can impact business in the bottom line and, and a myriad of other things. So thank you so much for joining us. Our goal at Real Creative Leadership is to make a bigger dent in the world and get more creative representation on boards and in companies and just overall elevate creative leadership in general. All right, well, today's topic, so let's get into it. First, let's, we're going to have a, a brief welcome from uh, Chris, and then I just gave you mine. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and you know, say hello and tell him a, little, a brief intro. Sure. Thank you, Adam. My name is Chris Doe. I'm a loud introvert, and I have a really big mission, which is to teach 1 billion people how to make a living doing what they love. In a former life, I was a graphic designer and I ran a motion design company. Now what I do is try and teach the world. Wow, excellent. And the topic for today, let's just click over, you know, one more and just get into that of what we're actually going to be talking about today and why Chris and why Adam today. Um, you know, because we get this question asked a lot, both of us in different ways. How do you grow a team? How do you hire? How do you manage time and resources? How do you prioritize all that good stuff? There are so many good questions around that. And the way we're going to handle this is Chris has an amazing uh, business and following and uh, perspective for the solopreneur of how you grow a business from just you and then move up from there. And my perspective and lived experience has been being part of advertising agencies or brand. And how do you take either an existing team that you get plopped into or one that you grow from within, within a, a large organization or medium sized organization. So those are our two different perspectives. And we're going to bring those both together to try and answer this question, because we know many of you out there come from a variety of different backgrounds or you have, you know, different jobs and roles as well. So, Hopefully, between the two of us, we'll be able to answer a lot of those questions of, of what's going on. All right. So what we're hopeful about this, this conversation is that we want to talk about how do you grow in the right way? How, is, how do you help a creative team add business value? How do you become strategic partners, not ticket takers? Like there's so many great things. A couple other quick agenda items. Um, you are going to see, for those of you who saw, who were here early, there were a couple polls that we're going to pop up uh, during this show. If the window comes up, just make sure you, you know, you're aware that it could show up right where you don't want it to be and you'll have to slide it to the side, which is fine. Um, I do want to mention a few other things. I want to mention a workbook. So at the very end of this show, what we're doing is we're collecting your questions, content from this, this episode. And then in a few weeks, we're going to send out a workbook based on all of the great advice from Chris and advice from me. And it'll be a workbook that you'll be able to go through and answer some questions for yourself and really figure out and dial in your own, your own plans for your own team. So pay attention and, and, and know that that's coming out. If you've signed up, you'll get that email with the workbook when it's ready. And then last before we get started is a, a note for our sponsor. So <clears throat> this special session, uh, a lot of people have helped get this together. And so we have relied on a sponsor for this and it is Creative Cloud for Teams from Adobe. And we're really grateful for them to sponsor this special session. So before we get started, we're just going to watch a quick commercial um, from the Creative Cloud for Teams group, and then we'll get started. Adobe Creative Cloud makes it easy to collaborate across all your favorite applications and devices, no matter where inspiration strikes. With our pro applications on mobile, seamlessly transition from your mobile devices to desktop and back again. Since your documents are automatically saved in the cloud, you can always go back to previous versions of your work. With Creative Cloud Libraries, you always have access to all of your team's creative elements wherever you need them. Maintaining consistency and scaling creative assets across your work has never been easier. With Creative Cloud, you can also easily work with others on the same document. Simply invite people to edit and get to work. 
When you're ready for feedback, share online previews that can be easily accessed by clients or stakeholders, even if they don't have a Creative Cloud subscription. Manage, organize, and stay up to date on all of your work through our desktop application. Whether working across teams or devices, Adobe has tools to make collaboration easy so you can create incredible content anywhere. All right, excellent. Thank you, Creative Cloud for Teams. All right, well, let's get started. So building a team, starting advice. I want to pass it over to Chris. Chris, go ahead and give us some good starting advice. When people ask this question to you, and then I'll get back to me of like, well, how do you answer it uh, initially? Okay, so here's the thing. Before you start, be really clear about where you want to go. If you travel really fast, but are headed in the wrong direction, it can feel like you're making progress, but you could actually be moving farther away from your goals. So be really intentional. This is why direction matters more than speed. So start with defining who your clients are. Can you pick them out from a crowd? What do they look like? What's their worldview? And what do they have in common? What problem are you solving for them? And get really clear about this. And now that you know what, uh, now that you know who they are, what expertise do you need to best serve them? What skills are you missing? And this is a clue as to how you might want to build your team. So making, making money is good, but understanding your goal is better. So a year from now, where do you see yourself? And how will you know you've achieved your goal? So for me, productivity is the byproduct of having very clear goals. And you don't want to just have any kind of goals. You want to have smart or smarter goals. So smarter goals is an acronym that stands for specific, what, why, who, where, and which. Measurable, how will you track your progress? And this is very important. You need to be able to define what they are so you can check them off a list. Achievable, is it realistic given your constraints and available resources? Relevant, does this matter to you or are you doing this for someone else? Sometimes we're actually pursuing someone else's goal and that's why we lose motivation. It needs to be relevant to you and what you want. Time bound. This one's critical. By when do you want to achieve this goal? And then you can evaluate and readjust as you go. So here's an example. Say one of your goals is I want to run a well-known design firm. And if you're tuning in, who doesn't want to do that? But the problem with this, it's too broad and it's too generic. So you want to be specific. Make it measurable and bound by time. So what we want to do is define what well-known means to you. Well-known can be measured by, say, the awards that you win, uh, being featured in prominent industry publications. Perhaps it's the size of social media following. So don't just say large social following. Say, I want 200,000 followers on YouTube or Instagram. Be very specific. Maybe it's having a handful, say five, Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 clients. That would be really cool. And don't forget, you might want to rank in the top 10 Google search results for relevant keywords and then add a timeline. So say by the end of this year. Okay, so moving on to the next slide here. It took me a little while to learn this, but a business has, I guess, six core functions, which are marketing and lead generation, which is how people get to know you. This is really important because people hire who they know, like, and trust. So the first, first part of getting clients is to get known. And to, to quote Austin Cleon, uh, to, to be known, you have to be knowable. Mm -hmm. Next is sales. This is once you are able to identify prospects and, and you're able to qualify them. Sales is how you bring them in and how you close them, which also includes things like pricing, how you determine value measured against impact created for others. Production is how the work is produced and the controls placed on quality. Service is how you forge a bond, an unbreakable bond with your clients and the memories that you create. Lastly, it's leadership. Leadership is about forecasting, planning, and spotting the icebergs before you hit them. Back to you, Adam. Well, thanks, Chris. That's a good perspective on the on if you're building your own business. But for me, I'm going to talk about, so what about if you are you know already at an existing company, you already have an existing team, or you're starting at a new company where there isn't a team? or you're just barely becoming a creative leader. So my advice that people come and ask first is, all right, the first thing I wanna say is, all right, before you build a team, number one, you've gotta decide if you're ready. Many think they are, but then they run back to the creative cave and it's a problem. And I've seen this happen over and over. And we're used to it. We grew up in the creative cave where we go and when we get really productive, we're like in the zone, right? We're, we're in the flow state. 
But when it comes to leadership or running a team, you can't just keep retreating back to that safety net. So you have to be ready. And there's a lot, uh, there are many soft skills you have to learn in order to jump into a, a creative leadership position. But if you're there, next, step two is figure out what your team will create and what you won't create. That is a major problem that happens all the time is, especially when you're in a, in a large company, everyone will come at you with requests. And if you just put an open request ticket system, you're just gonna get, you know, I've had random things like someone in sales wants me to write their bio for some top, you know, presentation or something because they're like, oh, you, you guys have writing and you have design. I want you to do all the work. So you need to figure out what your team will create, find the line and make a, a, make a line in the sand and only do that work that really impacts the business in the right way. And you can do that by, you know, talking that out with your supervisors or your CMO or whatever it may be, but really figure out what work is most important and then prioritize that. Next, after you have it figured out of what you're going to do, then it's organizing and balancing the team so that everyone benefits from their strengths. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about this later on, so I won't get too deep into it, but organizing your team, balancing them, making sure that they have the right ownership and accountability is critical. And then it's all about figuring out those gaps. And I think most of the questions come from people where there are gaps, like, who do I hire? What do I put in that spot? How do I scale? How do I figure that? Like all of that we're going to address here in just a little while. And my last advice then finally is, move from ticket takers to, to a strategic partnership. And that one's really challenging. <clears throat> a lot of young uh, teams are just used to taking in all the work and doing it all. And then you just become a service organization. And what you need to do is figure out creative, in creative leadership, you want to own creative strategy, meaning how is creativity going to impact the business in a positive way? And what is the, the plan to get there? What are the types of things we build? What are the, the ways we do it? How are we going to interact with the audience? All of that good stuff. And the more you bring that creative strategy to the table, the more you will turn into a strategic partner and not just, uh, you know, a ticket taker. So those are the, that's the opening advice I usually give uh, for someone who's asking me that, that question. All right, but we're going to move on. We're going to talk about creating a vision for your team um, because this is an important first step. So before you get into all the organization and team balancing and all the good stuff and who do I hire, which we'll get into, the first thing you need to figure out is having a creative vision. So I'm gonna go through how I would tackle that. And then I'm gonna pass over to Chris and he's gonna talk about how he would do that. How do you create a vision for your team? So for me, it all starts with some basic questions. Um, so years ago at an agency that I worked at, I, I had a boss, Dave Thomas, and he taught me a phenomenal lesson. He said the number one thing, and this is true for whether you're working at a brand or you're working at an ad agency, it's know how your client or how your business makes money. I mean, really know how they make money. Not just, all right, I'm just gonna go out and make a bunch of videos because I think they're cool. Or I you know, just came out of you know, this company, we built this and so we that. No, no, no. How does your company make money? How does your client make money? And then really understand that and start to build back from that in terms of how you're gonna help with creativity. And another big question people always ask is, uh, they're like, oh, I work for this company that makes trailers and there's really, it's a B2B business and it's just kind of a pass through. It's really all about transactions. How do I make that more creative? And the next question I would ask is, have you asked yourself is not just know how it makes money, but number two, <clears throat> what's the business strategy? Um, because if you, there's a book called the, the Discipline of Market Leaders by Tracy and Wiersma. You should go check it out. And it's the three basic types of business strategy. And when you really understand them, it helps a lot. For example, the three basic types are uh, operational excellence, and then it's uh, customer intimacy, and then finally product innovation. And in those three business types, if it's a customer intimacy or product innovation, creativity makes a huge difference. You're making those deep experiences that really connect and drive loyalty, right? But when you're talking about that squirrely business model of operational excellence, where it's maybe like this trailer company, that business model is all about operations, moving things through, low price. Like they're not concerned with relationships. They're not concerned with experiences. It's just burn and churn and moving it through. And then I'd have to ask, make you ask that question of, do I, does this business really support a lot of creative ideas or creative strategy? So if it doesn't, then you just either need to buy the bullet or you need to move on to a new company. But understanding that business strategy helps immensely. All right. So I'm going to pass over to Chris. We'll get into more of like, once you know your business and you get into balancing the load and doing all that stuff, we'll get into that. But let me pass it over to you, Chris, of like what you would do for creating a vision. Great. Thank you very much, Adam. So for me, we need to understand as a small design firm, as you grow, you kind of need to know what niche you want to be in. So this is about understanding your discipline for the industry. So let's get into it. 
a lot of people will debate about whether or not there's an advantage to being a specialist or a generalist. I have a very distinct or particular opinion about this, but I want to share some thoughts and then allow you to make that decision for yourself. So I want to reference something here that I heard Blair N say that at the beginning of your career, success is achieved by saying yes to almost everything. We've all done this, Adam. I would say yes to logo design, brochure, editorial. Oh, you want to do an animated motion graphic? And that's what we do at the beginning because we need market validation. You're building relationships and exploring what you like and dislike. And this is important. But as you grow and enter into your second phase of success, it's achieved by saying no to almost everything. You got to be really disciplined and say, that's not right for me anymore. And I don't want to take this on. It's not the right fit. This is where you start to gain deep knowledge and build expertise by solving the same problem repeatedly. You gain insight, spot patterns, and gain levels of efficiency. Okay, so here's a quote for you. The difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. And that's from CEO Warren Buffett. Okay, here's another way to look at it. Let's move on to the next slide. Everyone starts out as an amateur. It's true, no matter who, how good you are today, we all started out not knowing anything. And the goal is to work towards becoming an expert. So in phase one, you explore everything to discover what you like and are good at. This is when you will start to narrow down your focus and pick one discipline. For us, it was going from design to motion design. See, a big broad world to design encompasses many th different things. And we decided, you know what? We're not gonna do web design. We're not gonna do print design. We're just gonna focus on motion design. But then you start to realize motion design is super complicated and it has many different disciplines baked into it, like typography, animation, editing, cinematography, compositing, creative direction, and, and live action direction, et cetera. So then you can then now narrow this down again by picking a very specific vertical. <clears throat> you can work on animated end tags, food and beverage commercials or, or videos, travel and leisure, et cetera. So this is the double diamond concept. You start here you expand outward and then you narrow it down to a lane and then you then you play in that space and then you find out, well, you know what? I'm really good at this thing and I, I really enjoy doing this. And I think this is the biggest driver for your potential success is to know who you serve and how to serve them. Okay, let's see where I'm at on the slide here. So let's move on to the next one. So the earlier you can identify your niche, the easier it will be to target your ideal clients, establish your authority and build your expertise. An expert is a person who has made all the mistakes which can be made in a very narrow field. Okay, so you want to pick a lane and you want to stay there. That's what you want to do. All right, Adam, back to you. Well, I want to just focus on this for a minute because this is really cool. There's actually a really good parallel for working at a large company, which is so many times a, a creative leader comes in and is just like, oh, I can do everything. I can do all this stuff. I, I can video edit. I can write and design and do everything you need. And maybe you, when you're working at a small company, you have a lot of hats, right? You wear a lot of hats. And so you do all that, but at big companies, perception is reality. And mm. when you're looking at what like the CMO or executives think about you, if you try and be too broad, it's not going to work. I, I, I would went through this in a, in a recent personal example, but it's like, you have to be known for something. So it's like you spread out, learn all that stuff, you know, learn all the disciplines, but then really do a, a focused thing because there is a wall there, a perception wall, and the only way to break through it is to like really be good at that one thing and be known for something so that people associate, oh, that person is the X person, right? They're good at X. And then once you break through that wall, I've heard it, and like then you, your opportunities, then you can start to be an expert in other areas uh, in perception uh, with leadership. And I think this is great for like personal brands too. Like you got to at least be, I like that you quoted uh, earlier that you got to be knowable. I think that's totally cool. Like that's what you got to do. Like focus and be so good at one thing, break through the wall and then expand. I think that's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. What if people say to you, Adam, but won't I get pigeonholed? Like if I start doing this and I have other interests, what happens then? Well, I think that's a perfect question. And the answer is it's, it's a long game. Short term, yeah, you will need to know, be known for that one thing. But is that pigeonhole you know? Like, because once you're there and once you made it through that wall, that's when you can start to expand and they trust you, right? It's about building those relationships. And then you can start to expand out. But you also have to keep this in mind. <clears throat> the only person stopping you from doing other things or moving on or creating something else with your career is you. So don't ever feel like someone else is pigeonholing. Sure, you may be known for one thing, but you can always change your job. You can always rewrite your resume. You can always, you know, go build those relationships once you've broken through and start to sell them and say, hey, I'll take on this responsibility. I'll take on that. 
and then you're known for a lot more. So it, it just takes time. I'd like to add two little ideas here. And I, I got the first idea from someone else. It was, it was back in the day when I was reviewing portfolios and the person who was re reviewing the portfolio with me, he said, here's what I want you all to imagine. Lay out all 13 pieces of your portfolio. And when the, the employer looks at your work, they're going to find the worst piece and ask themselves, could I live with this result? They don't look at all of the best work. They just find the worst piece that you've done <laughs> and say, well, if you turn this into me, how am I going to feel about this? And they're going to make their decision based on that, whether they're hiring you as um, a vendor for a project or they're bringing you on their creative team. Number two is a form of cognitive bias. It's called the halo bias. Okay. The halo bias goes something like this. Adam's a handsome man with a fully grown beard. I, I do not have such uh, hair delights. Okay. <clears throat> but you assume <laughs> because he's such a handsome guy, he must be really smart, strategic. He, he's probably an excellent designer, has really good interior design taste. So when, when you show somebody one thing that's really good, they just assume you're good mm -hmm. at a lot of other things, the halo bias. And the it. opposite is true, as we just demonstrated in the previous example. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Well, you, you, everything you said was wise, except the part about me. And we'll move on. <laughs> Because I'm excited for this next section. This next section <clears throat> is almost like a, a little bit of a game. Um, we get qu the, qu the question of who do I hire first? And then who do I hire next? And then after that. And then rather than us just going through a list, what we're going to do is we're going to do kind of a, uh, almost like a late night talk show little episode moment here where we're going to bring up the question or the answers of who I would hire first for both Chris and I from two different perspectives here from an existing company or if you're a, a solopreneur. And then we're going to discuss it briefly as to why we did that. So let's go ahead and <clears throat> start this off. Go ahead and okay. uh, we'll click onto the first one. Who would we hire first? Oh, this is really interesting. Does drum roll, drum first, roll. Should I go first? Why don't you Here go first? Go. go ahead. Let's see what you got. Okay, oh, so let's, let's bring it up. So for me, if I'm a solopreneur and I have creative skills, basically I want to be able to hand these tasks off to someone else. So I'm going to look for a junior. Why do I say a junior, not a designer? Probably because I can't afford it. I just can't afford it. So I'm going to have someone who could do maybe 70% of what it is I'm able to do and use art direction to level them up and maybe put the finishing touches. What would you, who would you hire? You know, it's actually pretty close. I mean, I just say a designer and, and right now I'm going to go from like a, an in-house brand, right? Not an agency, but the reason why is because so much of the work starts out with, we need design, we need art direction. Uh, a lot of times you can get some writing help from some of the, you know, project managers or, or, you know, strategists or whatever it is, but design is usually the, the most important first step. And it could be junior or mid-level, I guess, it depends on, on who the hiring manager is. Mm. So we're not right. that different. You just have not that different. Money. So we're pretty similar on this first one. Let's yeah. go to the next one. Ooh. All right, go ahead, take it away. Okay. So for me now, I, I'm, I don't want to work, deal with the clients all the time and answering emails and moving things back and forth and making sure everyone has things that they need to be doing. I'm going to bring on a project manager, a producer, somebody like that who can start to deal with stuff. And especially the, the client interfacing stuff, because that's going to take up all my time. So a project manager might also have the skills to, to help me do bids. So I'm going to teach this person how to do the bids. And then that's, that's going to save a lot of my time so I can focus on bringing up the junior designer and actually doing the work itself. What about you? No, that's interesting. Yeah. We don't have to deal when you're in a company, you don't have to deal with all the business stuff that early on. So I chose a writer. And the reason why is typically the creative director. And, you know, this is just saying we, we did some research with real creative leadership last fall, where we interviewed like 300 creative leaders. And they said, for the most part, most of the creative directors at in-house, the, the starting person was a designer. So I'm going off that assumption. So usually if, if I have a designer who's the CD and then the first hire was a designer, the third person would be a writer because <clears throat> a writer is going to be able to feed both of those designers, right? They're, we want in the creative department to start to get good writing into play because otherwise it's beautiful design and then really crappy writing. And that discipline, if any of you have worked in an agency of pairing a writer and a designer up together is critical because you get better ideas, better concepts, just all around. So it's not like the, the writer is just going to be writing stuff. It's working with the designers. And, and I just feel like there's usually a longer tail of design work to finish up projects. So a writer can jump onto the next one quickly, but then having one writer balance out two designers, it usually seems to work pretty well. I have a question about this. What kind of writer are you looking for and how do you find these people? Okay. So this first one is more of like, cause I'm going to bring up another type of writer later on. Okay. Typically this first type of writer is more of a copywriter, which mm -hmm. is someone who's, you know, like what you find in agencies. A copywriter is someone who's, you know, really good at writing headlines, emails, short form stuff, and really being succinct 
and just basically promotional advertising, that kind of writing. Because most of the work typically early on is like, yeah, we're doing events or we're doing email campaigns or we're doing a TV spot or whatever it is. And those kind of copywriters are used to doing more than just, you know, they, they didn't just graduate from, you know, college as, a, as in an English department and they're just used to writing. Like they, they have a specific skill around <clears throat> promotional advertising writing. And where do I find them? I find them at ad schools. I find them at agencies. I find them just people who have lived that life usually understand that type of work. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying. All right. Number three. All right. What do we have? Okay, well, so this is very specific to me, but I actually think in today's world, uh, video is a pretty uh, plays a pretty big role, even if you don't consider yourself a, a video production company. And I would hire a videographer and an editor because we tell stories, but the stories really come to life when you add picture, typography, music, and sound design, and you start to make things move. And it's also a big driver for SEO. So it's the service I'm going to do for myself, but also for my clients. And uh, as it turns out, even when we're doing a lot of brand work, the clients inevitably say, we need a video to tell this story. Mm. And that's when my ears perk up. So now you have another designer. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I totally agree with you on the video part. But I'm thinking in my world, it's like it's too early on to, to pull on a full-time uh, video person. Because knowing the, num the types of projects that come into an in-house team, there are so many, just a variety of projects. E again, email, website. Uh, events, all that kind of stuff is usually the lifeblood of a, of a, of a brand, of a creative department. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to video, we can outsource that. There are so many video production houses that we partner with. I mean, at Adobe, I think we've, we've got hundreds that we've, we've partnered with. Um, so we know, I, I know I can scale that externally for now. So I can scale video. I can scale some of the other functions, but in-house, like I'm usually hitting another wall of there's just so much design and writing work. And again, like I said earlier, I, I can have one writer that can feed a few designers, but you just need a lot of designers in-house. Now, if you're an agency, it's different. Like there, I, I would go down a different road, but this is just an in-house brand. So I would add another designer at this point so that we have, that, that would free up the creative director to start doing other things as well. So you have two designers and a writer on the team, and then the creative director can start to do other things, you know, directing video with an outside source or whatever. Well, this is really interesting because as a internal creative team to a brand, you said that you can outsource to another company to do the video work. Hence, the small design firm, us, we have video capabilities. And if we were in the service space, that might make a lot of sense. We can uh, supplement or augment some of the staffing needs that you have, right? Yep, totally. Totally. Okay. Exactly. All right. Should we move on to number Let's four? Let's do it. Okay. So now, you know, I'm feeling like we're getting a lot of work and I'm starting to feel a little taxed just working with one junior designer and I'm training them up and things feel pretty good. But now I think I need to bring in a senior designer, someone who can run projects and, and be more autonomous when it comes to working. They might have a specific strength that I don't have. Maybe they're really good at designing typefaces. So that would be an awesome add to our company or just there, or maybe they're just very particular about type. Cause you know, I'm a type nut myself. So it'd be nice to have someone in there who can really sit there and like, Hmm, I don't know about that. I'm like, I agree with you. Let's get on that. So I could sleep easy at night knowing very well that the quality of the work is going to be very, very high. What about you? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. For me at this point, like it's a project manager because we've got so much work and early on when there's just, you know, a couple people, we're handling our own project management or we're just interfacing with other departments or, or groups and it's been fine. But because the team starts to get bigger, it starts to get a little more chaotic. And that's when I would bring on a project manager because a project manager for me is not handling all your business billing and all that other stuff. It's just, how do I manage all the projects? How do I manage timelines? How do I manage and make sure that, you know, <clears throat> at least time is being used well, money is being used well, things are, you know, staying on, on, on the rails. So that's where we'd bring in a, a project manager to make sure that all the work that this team of four creative people is, are, is everything they're creating is, is, being taken care of. All right. Yeah. So let's move on to number five. So at this point, I feel like, okay, you know what? I can actually and should try to run this company like a legitimate business. I probably need to bring on some professional services, a lawyer, a bookkeeper, accountant, uh, maybe even a business coach or advisor. And I don't mean to have all these people on full time, but I got to get my legal documents up. And, and some people might advise, well, you should have made that as your first hire. Well, I'm just telling you from the real world, when you're, when you're scrappy and bootstrapping everything, you're not always thinking, let me spend $400 an hour with an attorney with money I yet don't have. 
and I have no accounts, so I don't need a bookkeeper either or an accountant. And I'm just getting up and running. So I don't even know what problems I have. Uh, what you, what I don't know what I don't know yet. But a business coach for me at least was hugely transformative and took me from like one level and helped me to break through to the next stratosphere. So the one person I would say that you might want to talk before you even hire your first junior designer actually is to get an accountant to set up your books properly because that's how you're going to keep track of the money that you theoretically are going to make. Back to you, Adam. Yeah. And again, we don't have to uh, in, in-house there's that function is already handled by another department. And at this point, I put video producer and editor or motion graphics person. Um, and the reason why is <clears throat> it's important to understand that there's actually a, a, a wall that you hit when you're growing a team. Um, you can get a few designers and a writer and it's like you get enough work that you keep everyone busy, but it usually gets to a point where, you know, maybe when you have three or four, that it's really hard to justify more headcount in some instances to, based on the amount of work. Like you'd have to have a lot more work and especially someone who's specialized because you can always scale, right? You can scale externally. I can go get a small boutique and I can get um, either freelancer to get more designers, more writers or more video or whatever the project is requiring. It's like, I can scale up and scale up and scale up to a certain point. And when it gets to that point where I'm spending too much money externally on scaling, and and I'm not and I'm not uh, you know getting enough value out of it. That's where you can start to get someone who's specialized. So someone who does video and motion graphics. Again, today, like Chris was saying earlier, there's just so much video and social and and other elements that are part of brand building and, and content creation. That having a, a video editor or motion graphics person is critical. But I only put it further on because of that wall. Like you've got to you've got to build up enough. Um, using scale externally to get to that that spillover point when you finally say, okay, I'm going to get someone who's very specialized. I want to grab onto something that you just mentioned there, Adam, because you were talking about like how you were spending a lot of money. Say you were hiring us to, to do all this video work. At a certain point, you're looking at it probably with your project manager. Like, are we spending too much money with Chris and his team? And like, yeah, we probably should hire this and bring this in-house. And the reason why I want to mention this to you is because if you're running a small creative firm and your client is just writing check after check, I think you start to realize something that eventually this is going to end. And this usually catch, catches people like uh, off guard and like, oh my God, the client just called us and said, you know what? We're no longer working with you. It has nothing to do with whether you're good or not. It's just they're realizing they need to start to build this expertise in-house. And so be on the lookout for that. And if you suspect that might be the case, I would suggest you pick up the phone and call your client and say, you know what? We've been doing a lot of work with you. And I want to have a conversation with see how we can save you some money or how we can deliver more value so that you prevent them from bringing someone in house. So if you make their life easier, they might be willing just to spend a little bit more money. So make that call. So that's yeah. a life lesson. That's brilliant. And, it, and it's true. Like I consider my my current team, or we consider our current team, all the other vendors or agencies or firms or boutiques, we consider them extensions of our team. And so it's really, is, is the better you can be at having that relationship and saying, hey, here's how I'm gonna provide more value in this way, or I can give you, some, you know, some video production capabilities, but also this script writing or other things that you see gaps with the brand that they don't have. And then you can continue that relationship by, by scaling in that way. Let's yeah, move on. I, just, I know we got to cruise yeah. through these last couple. Yeah, we do. So I, I apologize. I was going to say something really quick and we're going to move on. I'm telling you this from experience. I've lost clients before where I thought everything was gravy and then one day it's gone. Okay. My next hire is at this point, I feel like we're growing our agency. We need to bring in a strategic thinker, a writer, play both roles. And this is going to be an expensive hire. And that's why it's so deep down here because a good strategist is going to cost you a lot of money. But this is where we can provide additional value to our clients. So at the beginning of our career, what we're doing is just trying to get better at our craft. We're not trying to say like we're an agency or a strategic marketing partner. No, we're just barely learning how to do what it is that we do and adopting professional practices. So at this point, I feel like, okay, maybe we're two, maybe three years into our business and I'm going to need to hire someone <clears throat> who's a strategic thinker, someone who can bring that kind of brain to the operation. And so that's who I would hire. What about you? Kind of similar. I mean, I put UX designer, a digital strategist, one or the other. And again, the UX designer is its specialty, right? There, there may not be as much work early on, but later on when you have a, a lot of projects and you have multiple designers, then yeah, a UX designer is phenomenal to help drive all your web and, and digital experiences. Or a digital strategist doing the same thing, like creative strategy. Again, if you want to move away from ticket taker to, to strategic partner, that, that creative strategy is critical. So I, I agree on that point. 
Okay, I think now we're into our, the final stretch, our seventh hire. And of course, we can play this game until the end of time. Yeah. But for me, yeah, I think I need another designer. So we have a junior, a senior, and guess what? We need another designer. And I'm probably going to look for someone who has additional skill sets that the team doesn't offer. It could be 2D or 3D. But having a 2D After Effects animator can actually add a lot of pop to what we're doing. They can mock up things for websites. They can also uh, add to presentation designs that we do or or add some sizzle to these videos that we're producing. That's my seventh hire. All right, yeah. awesome. And mine is a different type of writer, right? We mentioned this earlier of what a copywriter is, but typically, um, especially if you're in B2B and you have a long sales cycle, at this point, there's probably a lot of content you're creating. And you know, you could you could again scale this outside with a with a firm, but usually there's there's a lot of it's almost like you're creating articles or blogs or, you know, longer form writing. And so I would actually get a content editor and a writer. So that way, even if I am scaling externally, I have one person who's kind of owning the voice of long form editorial and understanding how and when and what we do with, with those types of projects and really guiding those projects. So that's where I would bring in a second writer or editor to manage all of that. Okay, fantastic. So now you can see the contrast between the way Adam and I would hire, depending on if you're working internal <coughs> to a brand or if you're running your own creative studio. So let's move on to the next slide. So now, now that you have your team, right, what are you going to do? So for me, uh, okay, we, we know who our clients are. We've we set smarter goals. So we know where we want to be at year one, year two, et cetera. We built up a team theoretically world-class creatives. The next challenge is how to organize all this work. And so this will be kind of interesting to compare notes. Now, Adam, I have no idea what you're going to say, so this will be really fun. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so do we start off here? Let me just move this off the screen. Is Okay, weekly meetings. First of all, weekly meetings to me are a productivity killer, so I try to stay out of as many meetings as possible, but they are necessary. So we've reduced it down to one meeting a week. We're going to probably do a Zoom check-in, set weekly goals, identify <clears throat> necessary resources if we're deficient in one area or over-resourced in another. We want to assess the progress relative to monthly or quarterly goals and allow the teams to, to have clear direction so they can work autonomously. What about you, Adam? Very similar up until a certain point. Absolutely. What I would say for your team, they want to have as much you know, flow, flow state time as possible to get the work done. And so minimizing meetings is, is important. I mean, we've had ideas, you know, usually I would say typically it's a, it's a Monday morning. We're going to get together, go over the work for the week. Who's got what does, you know, if someone has too much, someone has too little, we want to balance the load a little bit. That's, that's absolutely kind of your organizational meeting. And then sometimes we've had it where there are days that you don't have any meetings. Like let's say it's Thursdays or Friday afternoons, no meetings so that it's only deep work. But I'd say for leaders, it's a totally different story. I know that a lot of creatives say, oh, I hate, I hate meetings. I don't want them. I want to eliminate them. But if you think about your marketing partners or some of your other clients, meetings are where they get stuff done. That's where they're productive. And it's totally the opposite of creatives where we're not productive. But if you're a creative leader, you've got to be in those meetings. You got to have one-on-ones. You got to be, you know, building relationships, build, you know, selling your creative strategy, selling ideas and, and, and keeping things moving. So I would say as a leader, you probably have, need to have a lot more meetings than, than your team. Okay. So no, next up is files, libraries, and systems. And for me, we're going to use something like Dropbox now, especially we're all working remote so that we have centralized storage. It's redundant and there's backups to it. We want to make sure we have proper folder templates, naming conventions, like how we use dashes and underscores versus spaces so that you can search it easily. We want to have shared an individual project folder so somebody doesn't accidentally delete someone else's files. So these are shared and these are, are um, kind of assets to be used throughout. And then we'll probably do selective syncing and redundancy. But during the Adobe commercial, I realized I'm not using Creative Cloud libraries the way I should. So that's uh -oh. for myself. Yeah. Uh -oh. Someone needs to school me on that, Adam. Yeah. Well, after, after the show, we'll, we'll talk, Chris. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. And for me, like as a creative leader, I think about this files, libraries, and systems. This is really building the creative machine, right? If you're going to build a, a, a department that's going to run smoothly, you have to have all of these things in place. Like, otherwise you will waste so much time. And let me just say, like backing up. So this is years, like I did 20 years in agency life before I ever joined Adobe. And I can't tell you how many conversations we had about, like you said, how do we, how do we label our, our, our files and how do we organize the server? Tons of them. And in fact, like I'm so old school, we had the problem of, all right, where are all the fonts? And you got to, you know, go 
find a Bernoulli or a, or a disk or whatever it is and go through all the files and sync them all. Or so-and-so doesn't have this project file or, you know, source files. And it was just like, it was an endless, endless, you know, disk drives and, and hard drives and sharing stuff around. So I will say, this is a plug to Creative Cloud for Teams. Like this, Adobe has solved so much of this for us as a creative team or creative leaders because it's all connected. Like right now, all the fonts are automatic. And I'm sure, you know, those who are new and starting out don't understand what a pain that was, but your fonts are there, your libraries are together. So all the images, all the, like the approved logos and artwork and things are just there in the library. And you don't have to go searching and finding and figuring it all out. And there's also beyond Dropbox, like Creative Cloud automatically, and most of us work in, in, in Adobe products, it already has storage, you know, capacity where you can save files. It also has, you know, ways that you can do reviews and approvals. And we're going to get to that later. But honestly, it, that has made a huge difference for our team is just using that connected system. It's phenomenal. Yeah, Adobe rep, you need to call me. We got to talk about this. All right. We'll, we'll get you features. connected. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to number three. So this is about project management. So there's some overlap here in terms of like your files and libraries and how you manage them. So the team, they love using Notion, using that in Notion, like it just make, makes my mind melt. Like I can't deal with it, but they can do waterfall timelines, links to resources. It, they, it, they basically can build a website, essentially an intranet. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll use also Dropbox paper to collaborate so that we can all write on a similar document. I also uh, used to love Trello. And Trello is a great way to move items. And we, we used to use this with our clients and they would have transparency into where things are. So we'd create a to-do, doing, for review, and then done thing. So a bunch of tickets would be uh, written up for to-do and my clients could see them as we're moving them around and they would only respond to for review. And if it needed to, to be worked on, they would make notes on it and they would move it back to do. And so my teams, we would cut out a producer uh, moving, uh, shepherding information from one source to the next, and they could see it in real time. And I love that. Yeah, and it's very similar for me. I, I've used a lot of products over the years. Even at Adobe, we used you know multiples. But several years ago, we moved over to uh, Workfront, um, not just because like the standard reason for using a project management system is, for me, it's it's visibility, right? Transparency, right. like you said earlier, like. Clients, teammates, partners, anyone can see exactly where the project is, exactly the right time. So you know what's going on. And it's so much easier to not have stuff just get lost in the ether, right? So having your project management system in place is, is critical. For us, the, the big benefit of, of Workfront is it's integrated with AEM and so many of other of our files and systems and storage of, of where all of our assets are. And then again, a, a year ago, Adobe bought Workfront and that worked out really great for us because we were already <laughs> using it. So now we own Workfront as at Adobe and it's just getting you know more and more integrated with all the Adobe tools. So the bottom line is if you're building machine, let's listen, I, I, I was opposed to project management systems years and years ago because it's just like, oh, so much busy work. But once you get, like if your um, studio manager or whoever it is, is, is really good at that system and they know it really well, it can be so smooth and quick and they can help keep you, you know, firing on all cylinders. It's, it's phenomenal. Mm. Okay. Number four, number four is approvals and delivery. Okay. So we don't do client service work anymore. So I'm going to talk about like how we do things today. Cause we're a content creation company. Most of what we do is video based. We're creating video assets. And so we use something like frame IO uh, for reviews. So that way we can park and make a comment and it seems to be the most fluid and it works really well for us. But back in the day, if we wanted to give feedback and for working remotely now, and we have people working in different time zones all across the world, what we'll do is if I'm reviewing a piece of work that's kind of complicated, I'll just screen record and I'll be zooming into the asset. And I'll talk about it and then I'll record a video and then I'll share that with the team. So when I go to bed, they might be coming online and now they can have a conversation in an asynchronous way. And I like that. That means that we don't have to force an overlap in terms of our schedules. People can hear it. And, and guess what? They don't have to take notes. They could just listen and just work off the file. And you don't have to worry, like, did they really hear me? Because they can just replay it. What about you, Adam? Yeah, it's so funny. For me, starting back, you know, in the mid 90s approvals, it was like we would have an ad with a sticker on the side and it would just be sent around and everyone would just sign it. And that's, you know, how we oh. did it. And it was like such a water flow system is it horrible. So today, uh, the most important thing we do is shared docs. And we do that with, with a shared PDF or a shared SharePoint, or even, you know, some of the, in the Adobe products, you can have, you know, shared reviews right within the, right within there. Um, and that's so important because 
you don't want the waterfall problem of one person makes a comment and then we wait till it goes around and then it gets to the next person. So those shared approvals are critical so that everyone's seeing it all at the same time. And even if someone jumps in late, they'll see all the work from everyone else. And, and, and if they make a comment, it'll alert, you know, the first person who made a comment so they can, they can haggle it out. So for us, shared, shared reviews and approvals is, is critical. Great. Uh, so we're gonna move on to number five, but I want to give a quick shout out to everybody in the chat. It's blowing up with like, oh my God, I didn't know about that software or that plugin or whatever. So it's it's popping right now. Awesome. Okay, next, archiving. This is really critical. I mean, especially if you do client work uh, to be able to, to uh, collect the files and to make sure everything that you need can be reproduced from that set of files. And then you're going to move that from active projects to inactive projects so that your team can then just leave that up in the cloud. Uh, one one tip here, if you're a service provider, I write into the contracts uh, that when we're working with clients that I only hold files three months after we deliver. So if they don't reach out to us after three months, they can assume the files are gone. And why would I do that? Because I have clients who call me six years later and say, <laughs> Chris, where's this file? Well, gosh, six years is a long time in the digital space. I have no idea where your file is. And now I have the liability of reproducing this thing because I didn't tell them. So unless they otherwise specify, and they never do, by the way, I tell them three months, how long we keep it. Otherwise, you need to pay us to maintain the file. Otherwise, you can consider it gone. Yeah, for us, so when you get into a larger company, it's so funny, I, I, I've worked at smaller places where they had like a big fireproof suitcase with gold-plated CDs so that, you know, or, or DVDs that, so that it was always safe and all the archives were, you know, protected because that's that's your 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 IP, right? Like that's your, the work that you've done over the years. But today there are better in online systems, like having a dam system where you have all of your asset management all in, a, in one system. Adobe has something of like that. So we just use our own product, but having a dam where you can have all your assets there and it's all linked, it's in the cloud, it's all, you know, saved, backed up, like it's critical. And then also ways of archiving it so that it's not, you know, like shrinking files and making sure things are put away. But we, we definitely have a marketing hub and a place where, not just we can go and find the stuff, but anyone else in the company can go into the marketing hub and do a search and find an asset and find a video if they're looking for it and then download it. So having a centralized archive for us or for large companies is critical so that you're not, like think of if, if you got a request all the time, like, hey, I need this file or I need this thing, like, it would just take so much time away from you. So that's why for us having a centralized hub where everyone can access it is critical to saving everyone time. So for everyone who doesn't know what a dam is, we're not swearing. He's talking about <laughs> digital asset management system, a dam. Yep. So gosh, you know, you need a dam system. <laughs> <laughs> and do you use one in particular that you can mention or no? Well, we use a, a Adobe Experience Manager, AEM. It's it's oh. an Adobe product. Yeah. For and the price of price. To be fair, it's but it's more for enterprise like larger companies. I'm I'm sure like a small a small little team or company probably couldn't afford a large enterprise one like that. So there are others out there that are, that are built. I mean, even within creative cloud for teams, you've kind of got your own built in one like that uh, with, with just your Adobe. Uh, it's like your, your cloud uh, storage can kind of act as a dam as well. We've been running a company for 25 years. We've looked into having a dam and it's kind of expensive. You're talking about also the data entry tagging everything. Mm -hmm. It's a massive undertaking, but for enterprises at your scale, it's absolutely necessary because that's a game changer to be able to pull an asset from anywhere. Okay, let's move on. Number six, number six. Number six, we're getting there. Yeah, we're almost there. So home stretch here, PR, case studies and content marketing. Well, when you're doing the project, it's best to start pulling assets and be thinking about it before you're done. Because it's like, oh, I wish I had a BTS behind the scenes photo of us talking about the design or a strategy document. Now it's toast. So be thinking ahead, plan, and then you'll have great assets to use for your website to build wonderful case studies and also do some PR. So pull selects, make sure you have your final renders. And, and for all the different formats these days, there's so many different like horizontal, vertical, et cetera, and grab the relevant behind the scenes imagery for social media. And this is a critical thing. It's so funny. Back in the in the '90s or early 2000s, at agency, I remember the way we did this is we had these huge rooms down in the basement with just really nice printed pieces of all the work that we had done. And when it was time for like, if you're going to pitch a new client or you're doing an award show or whatever, so you would go down there and collect all the the paper stuff. So today it's different. It is all digital, and the way we do it 
that I see a lot of people do in the industry is to create these video case studies. So it's like you go through and that way you have an opportunity to say, here's what the problem was. Here's who we were going after. Here's our creative solution. And here's everything that happened on it. And just do a really cool creative case study in a video. It's a lot more work, but if you have a couple good shining stars through the year, like that'll just not only convince your internal team or even, you know, projects we need to do or award shows or just growth. Like it's just, it's great to have those, those around. So, you know, figure, you know, pick your battles. You can't do that much work on the side for everything, but again, find those, those shining examples and then make sure you, you sell it because even in a large company, especially people may not know all the great work that you've done because of silos. So sharing that out really helps your team get more credibility and then also more support and partnership. All right. Well, we're done with that. So let's move on to our last section that we want to talk about, which is creating priorities for you and the work. Um, because it's enough, like we talked about, here's how we get organized. Here are the people we hire, you know, all that good stuff. But now it's a matter of, all right, I've got so much work. I can't get it all done. What do I do? How do I make sure that I get this all taken care of? So we're just going to talk through a few different ways of how you can prioritize your work and, and make it happen. Because this is the reality for me is like, if you don't do some of these things, you'll get a million requests and everything is a tier one, especially in a larger company. You're getting requests from a lot of different teams and different uh, groups. And for them, their project is the most important project on the planet, right? Of course. And so you can't, you can't manage that. You can't be effective and efficient if you're just taking everyone's work as a tier one. So let's talk about, let's move on to um, the first section here, which is tiering system for your work. I'll go through how I do some of the stuff, Chris, and then I'll pass it over to you. So um, how we do a tier system. I talked earlier in, the, in this presentation of, all right, you've got to find the gaps, see what type of work you need to do, and then really figure out what the best work is that your team should work on. For example, it could be the high level stuff of like branding and the website and maybe your demand programs, but things like presentations, you know, PowerPoints for salespeople, some of those other things may fall below the line. And so really understanding, first of all, just like do a big line in the sand to know what's right and what's wrong. For us then, once we get all of that, that work, we go through this tiering process all the time. We'll say, okay, maybe make a grid. And I think we're gonna have this on the, the takeaway that you get in a couple of weeks, which is you've got to look at a lot of different factors because it's not just easy to say, oh, everyone's work is all the same, great. No, you have to look at how much budget is behind it, how much exposure, how much uh, executive involvement, how much time and effort it's gonna take. There are a lot of different variables that you can figure out. And we just kind of plotted those all out on a, on a grid. And then we start to, to map and say, okay, this, this piece of this project hits on all of those. Therefore it's a tier one. This next one, it's like, maybe it doesn't have as much money or maybe it doesn't have this, but it's gonna take a, a ton of work. That's a tier two or a tier three. And you've got to really put some lines in the sand of like, what's your tiering system? Maybe it's supporting certain groups. Like we're gonna support the brand way more than we're going to support sales or vice versa. So you figure out what's right for your, your team or your business. And then you create that system of tier, tiered work. And then your team focuses mostly on tier one. And then that's, this is how we do it. We focus all of our team on tier one work. Tier two work, we get vendors or uh, people that, you know, like agencies to help us. And we work with them and guide the work so that we have people who are like really close, like extensions of our team. And then they help get that work done. That way we can get tier twos done. And then tier threes, we'll just say, okay, here is a vendor, here are some templates, here's some guidance, and we give light creative direction and then just let that group run on their own and, and figure it out because it's kind of a lower tiered thing. How about you, Chris? Okay, mine is very similar and I'll do this really quickly. Three tier systems, the same kind of thinking. Tier one is new business. We need to get new business and oftentimes it means doing promotional things, sales calls, following up on leads, et cetera. But when we were working in the commercial space and working with advertising agencies, we had to pitch a lot. Yeah. And so you want your sharpest, your best people working on the pitches. And this is a sad reality of how design firms are run. You put the best people on the new business. And when you win the business, you then hand it off <laughs> to the team to produce the work. And so it becomes this really weird thing that who works on the pitches isn't the one who's going to actually be running the projects many, many times as your team scales up, then they will do that. So tier two is when well, we have active projects and whatever has the most urgent deadline relative to their budget, we have to prioritize. Now, if we're doing our job well, we're not siphoning off team members from other projects. We're staffing up in anticipation of booking the work. So this is where we have a small core team and we'll expand with freelancers to do the work. 
And, and tier three would be like internal work, work that's important for us to do, like working on the website, making sure the, the copy and the case studies are on point. And that's tier three, where if you don't have anything to do, work on that, work on some self-promotional stuff for the for our firm. That's it. Cool. All right, let's move on to the next one. The next question people often ask is, okay, how do you balance your own time? We get tearing the work and tearing, and getting it all organized, but how do you organize your own time? And that's really a tough question. I don't know if I'm going to have the perfect answer, but for me, it's again, do the same exercise as if you're a business. What, what are the things that are going to work the most for you? Now, I know there are some out there who are essentialists who have re read the book Essentialism and they just want to prioritize the one thing and focus on it. And that's great for like a, I don't know, if you're going to be a rock star, individual creator, awesome. But if you're managing a big team or managing, you can't do that completely. So you have to prioritize yourself too. You have to say, okay, this is how much time I'm going to do reviewing. This is how much time I'm going to focus on creating vision for the team. This is how much time I'm going to focus on selling. <clears throat> and really that's where it gets into the question of who do you hire or who do you have on your team that starts to take on more and more of that work? It really is a, a matter of delegating, like pushing down as much as you can. All right, you, this person is in charge of this type of work. This other person in charge of all the video. This other person is in charge of all the demand work and the emails. And this other person is in charge of the, the website. Like you've got to start pushing down that responsibility to give yourself <clears throat> space to breathe. So prioritizing your time is critical. And it's not, there's not an, an easy answer for it, but just slowing down and thinking about it and really, you know, again, prioritizing your, your time and using it wisely. Yeah, you? I'm, I'm right there with you. The only thing is, as a person who runs a business, for me, I have to put myself into the leadership position. So what I need to do is free up and consolidate consolidate the largest amount of discretionary time possible to just bring that in. So I hire creative directors who once were designers and they became art directors and then promoted to creative directors. So they do the new business pitch. They win the work. They run the project. So they're out of the queue. And so it, very little of it impacts me, except for when, and the way that we manage is I'm, I'm very hands-off, laissez-faire, you know, you do mm -hmm. what you need to do and only ask me if you need a second set of eyes, if you're unsure about the pitch, if you're stuck, if you need a resource and you can't figure something out, then they would bring that to me because <clears throat> I'm not a looking over your shoulder kind of uh, owner. So I use the rest of the time to be thinking about like, where do we need to be in six months to a year? So I can spot the trends and the shifts in the marketplace to hopefully help us avoid the iceberg. So when we talk about, are you working in your business or on your business? You got to make sure that you're not always heads down doing the work because then nobody's heads up looking at what's about to come. And this is how we see people get sideswiped in the marketplace. And then one day they're just completely wiped out and out of business. Oh, excellent. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and say like, we only have a little bit of time left with everyone here. We're just going to skip to the end here. Um, there are, a lot, we got a lot of questions that came in. I'm not sure how much time we have for questions. I, I would say if you've sent some in, you know, Chris and I, we can look through them later and we can, you know, I, I'm happy to respond uh, in some emails if I want to connect with some people. But I do want to at least give a, a, a half chance for us to have some yeah. shout outs and some closing remarks of, of how to, you know, close this up a little bit. But um, so <clears throat> first of all, here, let's, let's just talk about how people can get in, in, in touch with all of us, because I think that's pretty critical. If you want to flash that slide up on the, on the screen, because A, we appreciate everyone coming here and you've got a lot of big questions and awesome things. We just kind of running short on time, but um, here's how you can, you can find some of us. So the future.com, that's exactly where you can find Chris. He has a lot of amazing stuff for solopreneurs classes, lessons, workshops, everything that you need to be awesome at your job and really, you know, improve. So please, please, please go to the future and watch all of his show, all of his episodes and all of, and sign up for everything you can. So that's, that's one. Anywhere else that you, that people should find you, Chris, that you're out I'm there. everywhere on social media, Adam, at the Chris Doe. You can find me everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Even everywhere. the, even the platforms that aren't invented yet. He's on. He's on. <laughs> I will register my account. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. And then as far as this show, realcreativeleadership.com, you can find us at that URL on our website and just check out all of our past uh, episodes on ways that you as a creative leader can scale your team, improve processes. You know, we're, we're all the stuff that we talked about today, we have a, probably a session dedicated just to that specific topic. So go check that out. You can also check it out on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel where you can watch it or your favorite podcast platform, any, of the, any and all of the podcast, podcast platforms will have real creative leadership on there. 
And then next, I want to move on and a big shout out to the Stoke Group. They are the ones who produced this whole show and they help with real creative leadership every time in producing it. So if you need help as scaling or a partner who can do the work, they've done a phenomenal job on both the slides and presentation, everything we've been working through here. So please look for uh, the Stoke Group. And then me personally, uh, you can find me at adamwmorgan.com. That's where you can find a link to my Medium magazine where I write articles or you know, past presentations, my speaking gigs, all that kind of stuff, even about my book. I've got a, a book that came out a year ago on proving the value of creativity to your, your leadership teams. And then finally, I want to give another big shout out to Creative Cloud for Teams. Creative Cloud for Teams are the ones who sponsored this, this uh, episode. Huge, grateful thank you for them in, in helping bring Chris and I together to talk through all of this. Again, I feel a little bad that we, we went so long, we didn't have a lot of time for the, the Q&A. And I know, Chris, you love the Q&A and we wanted to really dig into it. And maybe we can try just one question right after this. We'll, we'll pull one question out and, and answer it and just go a little bit over for those of you who can hang on with us. But the last thing I also want to remind you of is the, the final ask. Everyone who signed up for this uh, session today, A, we're going to send out a recording. And B, in a couple of weeks, once we've gathered all this info and put it into that workbook, all the great advice we heard today and all the questions you had, look for that workbook because it's a great chance for you to go on your own and look through all the stuff you need to do, uh, you know, go through exercise of how you prioritize work, go through questions on who should I hire and why, and just give yourself an opportunity to, to figure it out for your own team. I know that that's probably going to go a long way more than just us and answering one person's question. This is an opportunity for you to dig into your own business, your own team, your own work, and really figure it all out for yourself and, and make a, a bigger impact. So look for that. It's coming soon. If you have questions, you can always email us and reach out and, and, and find out about it. But just know that it's going to take a couple of weeks and then we'll send that out to you. Are we going to do a question or we run out of time? Let's, let's just do one. Let's do one okay, question. Do I know one. we're over. Sorry, everyone, but thank you for hanging out here. So go ahead, Chris, you take it. Okay, so the question, this is coming from Tyler H. How do you strike the timing balance, taking on additional employee overhead and revenue increase? In other words, how much financial runway should you have confirmed prior to hiring on new people? Excellent question. I'll do this really quickly, okay? So this is this is very common. You're doing work. You're doing the work yourself. This is fantastic. You're getting confidence and skills. I think you should start to immediately ask yourself this question. Kind of hire someone else to do this work at a certain level and still make money. So if you get paid $200, an hour to do something and you can hire someone from 80 for 80 bucks an hour hire that person this is how the economy gets moving bring in some junior uh, level them up and, and teach them but bring them on on a part-time freelance contract basis only this is critical people will show you amazing portfolios and you're like you're amazing and then it, then you learn later it took them four weeks to make that logo that you thought took them two days and then you're <laughs> going to be shocked so this is kind of like very much like dating don't get married yet go through a long courtship period. A lot of people will tell you, uh, hire slowly, fire quickly. I'll, I'll, I'll endorse the first part, hire slowly. Just make sure they're good, that you're able to do this work. And then you're going to slowly add to your team and free up your time. Anytime you can delegate a task to someone else who could do it for less money than what you charge, you should be thinking about bringing someone else on. Adam, what about you? Oh, that's exactly, exactly how we do it. You know, you can't, you can't just hire and then hope that you have the work to cover it all. You, you really have to be careful. And it's like scale and freelance and bring on people who you know and you trust, you know, a little at a time until, until you're paying them so much that you could easily just hire them. Like there's, there's just a balancing yep. act that you have to go through. So 100%, that's how we handle it. Okay, we did that pretty quickly. So Adam, I think we have to wrap. Is that right? Or Yeah, we do. do and, I, okay. and I apologize, everyone. My, my daughter's high school uh, graduation is happening yes. in a half an hour and I've got to race <laughs> to the stadium and, and see it. So. Sorry, we couldn't stay on longer and give more questions, but thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for joining us today on this special session. Again, look for emails for more good information coming. We appreciate all your questions. Chris and I actually are gonna go through and look at them and read them. We're, we're gonna, you know, we, we definitely understand a lot of the questions that are coming. So if you want, you know, you can reach out to me on, on my website or an email, or you find us on social, ask questions, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take it to other channels if, if you need to. But again, just keep, Keep showing up for the shows because we'll probably answer a lot of those questions in other shows and other episodes on either of our platforms. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate it. I have an idea, Adam. First, oh, I want to say it. thank you. I want to say thank you to you, Adam, for inviting me to be a part of this, for Adobe for supporting this, and for Stoke for doing most of the heavy lifting. And I will say this, if, if it's okay, if people want Please. this, Stoke, you can give me all the questions. I'll go live somewhere and I'll answer all of them, the ones that I can. Okay, so I want to make sure we we honor the questions. So I heard that we had hundreds of questions and, and there are a lot of good ones in there. So I'll do that offline somewhere.
Yes, same here. I'm with you. We'll figure that out. We'll, okay. we'll find a way to, to get back to you all. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. See you all. See you next Bye, time. Bye, everybody. See you in the Ciao. future.